Marty Ashby is uh, our first guest. Uh, he is a, uh, a jazz guitarist, uh, Grammy award-winning producer, programming consultant, motivational speaker, and lifelong advocate of jazz music and its unique place in American culture. He is executive producer of MCG Jazz, which he started in 1987, and since then he has produced more than 2,000 concerts and 45 recordings on the MCG Jazz label, garnering five Grammy Awards and eight additional nominations. Mr. Ashby oversees the facilitation of the preservation of the MCG Jazz Archive Collection of audio recordings, video, photography, and specialty items and instruments. He was the EPP Goldman Sachs Fellow at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian and has worked with many jazz organizations as a consultant. Personally, I'm proud to call Marty a friend. He helped me uh, immensely with my uh, biography of Herbie Mann, whose archives are housed at uh, MCG. So Marty Ashby, welcome. Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Yeah, how many Pittsburghers do we have here? Just so I know. Okay. Got some homies? All right. That's, that's good news. Um, today, I just frankly want to have some fun and tell you some stories. I've been unbelievably blessed to grow up in the music business. And uh, my, my, my first memory in life is sitting on the glass countertop in my dad's music store in this little town called Baldwinsville, New York, up in central New York. And I remember sitting on the glass and looking up at this wall of guitars. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool as a kid. And, and I've only ever known the music business and, and baseball. Uh, those, those are the two things. Now, if I had all those guitars that were on the wall, I would not be here now, because I'd be retired someplace, uh, still, still seeing those guitars. I've been at this place, MCG Jazz, for 29 years, as Kerry said, and uh, it has been an absolute amazing um, process to be around some of the greatest jazz musicians in the world and interact with them and record with them and produce them. Um, literally a dream come true. I pinch myself on a daily basis. Um, I, I got to this real quickly to kind of set the context. Um, when I moved to New York after, after undergrad, um, in music, I moved there to be a jazz star, because that's what you do, of course. If you want to be a jazz star, you move to New York. And in order to survive, I ended up doing three or four jobs, and one of the little ads I answered, um, and this was at the early 80s, like 1980, uh, in the paper, was sell subscriptions to the New York Philharmonic. I said, well, they're a pretty good band. I, I know their music. I had, a, I had a degree in music. I love classical music. So I'll never forget and this is important because it'll take you to, to what we did here in Pittsburgh, the moment that I walked into Avery Fisher Hall in Lincoln Center, and I saw three floors of people that took care of these musicians. I rode up the elevator uh, to the interview with, uh, I think his name was John. I said, John, what do you do? He said, well, I'm the guy that puts the music on the stands for the orchestra. I said, what? You put the music on the stands? He was the assistant librarian. And of course, I kind of knew that there was a big infrastructure, but it didn't hit me until that moment when I was playing you know, jazz clubs and jazz you know, festivals and working with some of the greatest musicians in the world and in front of Bryant Park on the street on Friday afternoons and things like that. And here there was a business structure that had hundreds of people that took care of these wonderful musicians. So to make a long story short, with some of my dad's unique uh, sales ability that he instilled into me, I moved through management with the New York Philharmonic fairly quickly, ended up with the Cleveland Orchestra, uh, and eventually the Pittsburgh Symphony here for the inaugural season of Lauren Mazel, which some of you may remember those years. Um, and my, my goal was to figure out the business structure that what I call the OPAs, the other performing arts, opera, theater, ballet, dance, symphonic orchestras, what their business structure was so that I could put it into jazz and take all those techniques to present jazz music at the level of the other performing arts. Because 30 years ago, there were very few, there were two jazz subscription series in the country. Uh, there was not the kind of development programs that we have in marketing, sales campaigns. There was some festivals and clubs, sure, but there weren't the kind of Jazz and Lincoln Centers or SF Jazz or Manchester Craftsman's Guild. There weren't those institutions yet. Uh, so I was very fortunate um, to meet this guy by the name of Bill Strickland, which those of you from town probably know Bill. And uh, he built this building here. Let me see if this clicker's working here. 
Oh, look at that. So you know who I am. So here's the building on the north side. If you have time, you should come and see it. It's a fantastic building. Um, it was designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. It's a very uh, exciting place to be. And <laughs> sorry, sorry. My, my kids listen to this music, so it's, I'm kind of in it now a little bit. Um, I, I'm just going to motor through here. Yeah, I won't play my music over it. I'll wait until they get that, but I'll keep talking over it. So it's a fantastic building, and Bill Strickland, jazz music saved his life. He'll tell you this story that when he was a kid, he listened to jazz music in his ceramic art class, and he absolutely saw a vision for how the world could be by listening to Miles and Herbie Hancock and Joe Beam and all these fantastic musicians. So when he built this building, which is a training center, for inner city kids in the arts, and we also have a vocational training school here where we work with adults in the arts uh, to give them job training in a variety of things from orchids to culinary arts to medical technology. And if you come to the building, which is about five minutes away from here, you'll see across the street we have our office tower and then we have a huge greenhouse where we grow those orchids. And it's a pretty stunning facility. It's 1815 Metropolitan Street. And right across the street, Yeah, how do, how do we... Lenny, do we know how to turn that off, buddy? Yeah, it is a little annoying, isn't it? I couldn't agree more. Lenny, you got a mute button there, buddy. Not for that system. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Well, that just means that the room is free today. <laughs> right? I mean, right? I'm, I'm sure we can make that happen, Carrie. Right? I'm going to keep motoring on here. I'll just talk a little louder here. I, I assume they're going to get that in a second. So at any rate, Bill had the vision to, to build this fantastic, this is the music hall in there. Um, it's 350 seats, so it's like a big living room, which is why I love it so much, because it is so intimate. And to have, you know, Dizzy and everybody standing on that stage, the last row is about midway through this hall right here. So it's like a big living room. You get the, the intimate nature of playing the blue note, but the pristine nature of playing Carnegie Hall at the same time. It's really pretty special. And there it is full on opening night with the great Billy Taylor. Now, for those of you from Western PA here, if you dropped a bomb on that room that particular night, you would have wiped out all the money in Western Pennsylvania because it was all sitting in the room there to support this school and the music. It was really pretty exciting stuff. Um, so let me, let me kind of get into the, to the, to the crux of this that I want to talk about. So there's Diz. Uh, early on, I think that was 1987 uh, when Dizzy was there. And you'll see a guy by the name of Bill Strickland next to him on stage. Now, when, when we started the program, we recorded in analog 8-track, those Atari 8-track machines. You guys all know that, right? And 2-track, reel-to-reel uh, -reel as well at the same time. Uh, fortunately, um, when the building was built, there was some recording equipment um, uh, installed. Over the, t over the years, as we were able to raise money, et cetera, et cetera, we jumped onto the early 90s direct-to-dat phase. You all remember that? Everything was like direct-to-dat, right? So we did, we did a bunch of that. And then we started beta testing. Yes. Doesn't that feel much better? Wow, it's amazing what silence will do, right? <laughs> wow, right on cue. Um, and then we moved to, to two-track recording, um, and then we started beta testing for Tascam, which I don't recommend. Nothing against Tascam if you're out here, but we started beta testing the DA88 machines. You may remember those, and trying to lock those up. So now I've got, oh, maybe 2,000 hours of DA88 tapes that were still uh, digitizing into Pro Tools and trying to lock and bake the tapes and all that good stuff you guys all know about, right? And then we finally moved into uh, full HD Pro Tools uh, about um, 12 years ago or so, and we've been recording all the concerts in that format ever since. Um, but it was a, it was a thrill to, to kind of go through that process and learn it as it went, as the technology changed, we kept changing with it. Um, but the good news is, we recorded virtually every concert, aside from maybe one or two, um, over the last 29 years, and there's some stunning stuff. What I noticed by programming and being there and being in Pittsburgh is in the green room, there were so many stories about Pittsburgh. Now, not being from Pittsburgh, being from New York, 
Are you kidding me? Well, you had it for a minute, guys. If you can do it once, I guarantee you can do it again. It's a button that says on and off. So you go with the off side, right? Okay, there we go. Um, so in the green room, what I'd hear was constant stories about Pittsburgh. And I had no idea the magnitude of what Pittsburgh represented in terms of uh, the legacy of this music we call jazz. I'm going to just give you this next slide here. You won't be able to see it, but this is just the list of musicians from Groves Dictionary that I pulled out of Groves that are from Pittsburgh. And it's folks, don't try to read it because you'll go blind and deaf at the same time while we're doing this. Um, but people like Billy Strayhorn and Earl Father Hines and Roy Eldridge and Stanley Turrentine and Billy May and Mary Lou Williams and Errol Garner and Henry Mancini and Billy Eckstein and people you wouldn't think of like Horace Parlin, Dodo Marmarosa, are you hip to Dodo, who played with Charlie Parker for those jazz freaks out there, right? D Dodo actually came to the Guild maybe two years before he died and he was amazing back then but he went off the road uh, early on. So, you know, over maybe eight or ten years of hearing these stories the musicians would come in and it'd be the Herbie Hancocks and the Ray Browns of the world and the, and the, and the you know, on and on and on, the Carmen McRae's of the world. And they'd start telling stories about Pittsburgh and all these amazing musicians from Pittsburgh that they, they knew, they grew up with, they worked with. And I had no idea, like most of the world doesn't, that there's this kind of legacy here in Pittsburgh. And I know through the course of the conference, you're going to hear about, I think, Roy Eldridge and Mary Lou, maybe, and... Uh, Errol Garner, you're going to hear about Errol later, uh, and, and please take that all in, it's, it's fantastic stuff. So what I started to do is I started to focus um, many of the concerts on Pittsburghers. So this is the great Dakota Staten, uh, she was there several times. I really started to get into the notion of let me celebrate these Pittsburghers that are still with us and try to do as many things as we can um, to celebrate their music, bring them home. Some of them hadn't been home in many years. Um, here, here's a good example of one. This is maybe a little hard to see. It's Slide Hampton, the great trombonist, who's actually from Jeanette, PA, but we claim him in Pittsburgh as being from Pittsburgh. Um, and what we started to do, it was kind of interesting how it evolved organically, is we started to give someone like Slide Hampton the opportunity to create different kinds of programs. So he was there with a the quartet, he was there with the Jazz Masters, which was Benny Golson and a bunch of other guys with him. He was there with the World of Trombones. You can't quite see it, but that, that top slide, there's 16 trombones, um, and, and uh, that's Bill Watrous with him there as well. He was there with the Dizzy Gillespie Band, uh, alumni all-star band, which I played with for years. Um, he was there um, a couple other times doing smaller programs. He was a guest soloist with the Duquesne University Jazz Band. So Slide's body of work at the Guild spans six or seven different kinds of things. And we kind of fell into that, quite frankly, by accident, just because I wanted to celebrate these wonderful musicians from Pittsburgh. So we started, I'd call them up and I'd say, hey man, you got something you've been thinking about doing? Why don't you, why don't you come back home and let's spend a few days and I'll raise the money and let's do the concert and have some fun. And it turned out to be a really fantastic way to celebrate what these guys do. Um, let me see what, so, and there's tons others. I'm not going to go through all these, but here's some, you know, the great Joe Negri, you know, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, right? Handyman Negri, right? Well, that's, that's Uncle Joe right there, one of the greatest guitarists in the world. Johnny Costa was the pianist that we had at the Guild who was on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, who's that? Gene Ludwig, the great Grover Mitchell, trombonist that ran the Count Basie Orchestra for years, and uh, Master Humphreys, right there. That's Roger Humphreys, who was one of the greatest drummers in the world. Pittsburgh has a tremendous drum tradition, starting with Kenny Clark, uh, who is arguably kind of the father of modern bebop drumming, going to Art Blakey, who you've probably all heard of, and then Roger Humphreys is carrying on that tradition today. I just played with him in West Virginia yesterday for a group of uh, kindergartners through third graders. We did a series of uh, eight concerts in West Virginia over the last two days. I mean, out in really rural West Virginia, playing these jazz shows for kids and to a one, they stand up and scream when Master Humphreys plays his solo. It's really, it's really stunning stuff. And after you see the films tonight, you should all go over to James Street, which is almost walking distance from here. It's on the north side. It's a club called James Street because Master Humphreys is holding court with a jam session every Thursday night over there. I think it goes until midnight or one. So after you see uh, these amazing movies, you should run over and, and see some live uh, history being made. Um, and so then we'll move on here to the great 
Ahmad Jamal, also from Pittsburgh. He showed up with Billy Eckstein and Monty Alexander to the hall in 1988. It was our second year that we were there. And we got a call and said, there's a, there's a guy by the name of Ahmad Jamal at the front desk. And so I said, yeah, sure there is, right? So I went down and sure enough, it was Ahmad Jamal. Uh, he had Billy Eckstein with him. And um, he said, you know, we heard that this place had been built and we didn't believe it. And so we toured and we sat down and Ahmad said, well, what, what can I do to help? You know, this is my hometown, I want to do something. We said, well, you know, the last year and a half, you know, every time we have a concert, we have to rent a piano. So we'd like to, like to get a piano. And of course, Ahmad is a Steinway artist. And he said, uh, meet me in New York on 57th Street at Steinway um, on this date. True story. We thought, okay, um, <laughs> sure. But Bill Strickland and I went to New York, and sure enough, at 11.01, Ahmad walked through the front door. He had a cape on that day, by the way. <laughs> It's fantastic, right? Walks through the front door, and Steinway had prepared, I think it was five or six of their finest pianos in a room. And Mr. Jamal went and played each of the pianos, got down to the last tune, he said, all right, Marty, which one? And uh, Bill Strickland and I said, we'll play Point Sienna on both of them, of course, his, his famous tune, and then we'll know which one. And uh, the piano that you see right there is the piano that he picked out for us in 1988 that has now been played over the last whatever that is, uh, 26, seven years, um, by everybody from Herbie Hancock to Ray Brown to or to uh, Dave uh, Brubeck to McCoy, all everybody has played that piano and it's held up pretty well. Um, yeah, there he is. So we have um, started now. We're kind of three quarters of the way through. I mentioned this legacy of all this unbelievable music in Pittsburgh. Um, over the last 10 years, we've been working on a PBS documentary about jazz in Pittsburgh and the legacy. We've interviewed some 80 people, I think. It's unbelievable footage and things we're receiving from all, all kinds of places. It's really been exciting to uncover not only just the music and what's been going on with that you know, over the last you know, century almost, um, but also the stories of why Pittsburgh, what was in the water, what was it that, that had this unbelievable collection of musicians that changed the world? And some of the stories, I'll just give you a, a kind of a quick uh, underpinning of it, is that there, there, it wasn't just geography between you know, New York and Chicago, which isn't kind of an obvious one, steel towns, you know, some economic resource here, a lot of uh, major foundations, the Mellons, the Scaifes, or the Heinz family, a lot of resource that supported the arts. That's all part of it but it also is an entrepreneurial spirit. And no one, I haven't said this to anyone yet because it's kind of coming out of all these interviews, that when we think about the artists from Pittsburgh, so many of them are leaders, leaders, right? The Errol Garners, the Ahmad Jamals, the, the Stanley Turntings, the Ray Browns, the Roy Eldridges. These guys were leaders in women, Mary Lou Williams, leaders of their bands. Many other cities, um, produce a lot of great musicians, but a lot of them are sidemen. You know, they play, the, they're great and they make records, but they're not leaders, entrepreneurs, people who in two notes, George Benson, you can tell this George in two notes, right? Two notes, Stanley Turrentine, one note, whoop, that's T, right? That's all you need to know. You, you hear it in one note, right? So we're uncovering this interesting um, kind of storyline that it was an entrepreneurial spirit to be a leader and understood kind of the commercial applications of their music as well as the, uh, the harmonic and the musical applications, right? It's really interesting. We're still working it out. I want to play a quick, this is a short, like, minute and a half clip, uh, which isn't even fully edited yet. If you, if you would, Lenny, play this for us. Pittsburgh is phenomenal. I'm talking about when it comes to musicians and the art form. It's a rarity. It's a rarity here. And it still remains. When you talk about Pittsburgh, you're talking about a vast number of talented individuals has very few parallels. New York is, is, is not like Pittsburgh. People migrate to New York, and that, that, that's a town that houses people from Memphis, people from Kansas City, people from all over the world. The uh, foundation that I got in Pittsburgh is responsible for my, my growth. Unless your foundation is correct, you cannot build upwards. 
So you have more than just music. You have uh, uh, industrialists, you have a great philanthropic community. So Pittsburgh is a very interesting place. I'm probably the only one that put out a, a CD called Pittsburgh, dedicated to my mother, who's responsible for me being here, and uh, my hometown. I still love this place. Yeah, thank you, Lenny, for working on the EQ it was, as it was playing. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's the, some of these stories, man. I'll, t I'll tell you, we've we've got a, literally 80 interviews, and and the, the stories and the passion for uh, the legacy of this music here is really stunning, man. It's been an honor to even listen to these men and women tell these stories. Um, to kind of move into to some other just Pittsburgh elements, it's the great Ray Brown, of course. Uh, Ray was one of my mentors. Uh, he would come back home often. Um, really have an opportunity to um, get to know him. We did a variety of projects together. And I'll never forget one day he called me and he said he was coming with a trio. I think it was Benny Green uh, in the trio or maybe Jeff Hamilton on drums. And he said, Mari, this is Ray. And I said, yes, Mr. Brown. And he said, listen, man, I need two more hotel rooms. Don't even ask me why. Okay. Uh, he said, you've probably never heard of this young kid called Christian McBride. And uh, I said, no. He said, but you, you might have heard of John, John Clayton, this other bassist. And I said, yeah, I've heard of John before. Now, this is 1992, one or two. And so Christian was a kid. He was 17, I think, at the time. He said, I've got this idea, so don't even ask. I just need two more hotel rooms. I said, yes, Mr. Brown, of course. And so Ray showed up, and he had Christian McBride, the great bassist, John Clayton, who's kind of heir apparent to Ray Brown and, and himself. And he did this thing at, for the first half of the show um, with these just three basses. It's where Super Bass was born, uh, was at the Guild. And of course, we had the, we had the tape rolling. And a couple of years later, um, we put out our first recording. And the, the historical context of this is in the um, early 90s, we had an NPR series. Some of you um, are old enough like me to remember it. It was called Jazz at the Craftsman's Guild. Uh, it aired every July. Uh, we did five programs, and it was, in those days, it was on 320 stations. I mean, it was really well carried. We did it for four or five years in a row. And then I said, well, wait a minute. We're raising all this money to put this music up on NPR and produce it and make it all happen, which was a wonderful thing. It helped to build our MCG Jazz brand, for sure, because DJs all over the country knew us. I said, why don't we try making some CDs? Because back in that era, as we all remember, CDs were hot, right? right? You, could actually, you could actually sell more than two, um, you know, like today. So we started, and fortunately, we were able to, early on, on our very first recording, I was able to pull from the archive um, that thing that we recorded with uh, Ray Brown uh, that, that launched Super Bass. And he went on to do, I think, three records. Right before he died, he called me and he said, I want to make another record of Super Bass and do it live at the Guild. Uh, but he, did, he didn't make it to do that. So let's hear, Lenny, let's just hear a little taste of this. We won't hear the whole track. you don't realize what three basses can do, man, but they played an entire first half of the concert every night. In those days, the show, some of you from Pittsburgh may remember that we used to do four days of every artist, so they'd be in residence with us. It'd be like playing the Blue Notes, so Uncle Ray or Herbie Hancock or Herbie Mann or all those, Stanley would be there for, for we do five shows over four days. We do lectures at schools, we do all kinds of stuff, so they really got to be part of the community. Um, another artist I wanted to kind of just um, highlight because we have um, this is the great Stanley Turrentine from Pittsburgh, of course. Um, when he passed, Judith, uh, his, his widow, called and said, Marty, I got all this stuff of Stanley's. <laughs> Do you want it? <laughs> right? So we now have 
I, don't, I forget, uh, something like 40 boxes of memorabilia and recordings and tapes and all this that have all been kind of notated what's in them. We're starting to transcribe some, or uh, transfer uh, a lot of the videos and analog recordings and so on and so forth. Um, really stunning. Stan, Stanley was, was family with us. He was a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan, like huge. So he'd show up on Sunday afternoon for the matinee and come in the back door on his way to Heinz Field, which is, you know, half a mile from the concert hall. And whoever was playing, he'd just kind of peek his head on the stage and heckle them for a few minutes before he'd go up to the game. It was hilarious. He would do that all the time. And uh, he's another one that I'd say, well, what do you want to do? You know, Uncle T, what do you want to, what do, you want to do? Come to the Guild and let's do something different. So you see, just his outfits alone over four or five concerts changed. Um, uh, and that was always fun to kind of experiment with, with Uncle Stanley. So when we did the, uh, the concert, uh, we did a recording concert on this first recording as well. We pulled some from the archive and we did a live program. And when we did the live concert, I commissioned Stanley to write a piece of music. And of course, his most famous tune is called Sugar, which you probably all have heard. So he wrote a tune for the record called The Little Sweetness. Uh, let's hear a little taste of that, Lenny, please. Stanley was something. So if you guys know the tune Sugar, you see that that kind of sounds like sugar, but it's not sugar. It's a little sweetness. Uh, so that tune, uh, he went on to record a couple other times and he started playing it on live gigs. Now those are all Pittsburghers on the band. That was Roger Humphreys on drums, Dwayne Dolphin on bass, Dave Budway on piano. Uh, it was all Pittsburghers that we had playing on that band. It's pretty exciting stuff. Um, one of my other mentors that I just want to talk about for a second, um, who really encouraged me back in the early 80s to continue trying to present jazz at the level of the other performing arts was the great Dr. Taylor. Billy was a very good friend, uh, an amazing musician. And uh, again, he called me up and he said, listen man, I, I, I wanna come and play a couple days um, because we need to do a pilot for the Kennedy Center series. And I said, what are you talking about? So some of you may remember Billy Taylor's Live from the Kennedy Center NPR series. He had it for many years. It's fantastic where he'd play and he'd interview some people, then he'd play some more, right? So I said, well, of course, Dr. Taylor, let's, let's do it. He said, yeah, and I want to do it with my friend Jerry Mulligan. I said, well, yeah, okay, we can work that out. Uh, I'd never met Jerry, I was a big fan, you know, and Billy told me this story, he said, yeah, man, you know, we, we, we've known each other, we've never played together really much at all over these years, but we're best of friends. And he told me this fantastic story how he would, he and Jerry about every four or five months would talk on the phone, and when they talked on the phone it was for two hours. They would talk about music and life and all these, all these things. So they came to the Guild, and they just, they had so much fun. And we did the pilot for NPR, and of course it worked because he got the series and, and did the Live at the Kennedy Center series for many years after that. And uh, we recorded everything, really for the pilot, not so much for us, although we had it in the archive. And after Jerry passed, uh, Billy was back again from one of our anniversary concerts, and I said, Dr. Taylor, you know, that music that you guys recorded was really stunning. 
we should make a recording. And he said, yeah, it's fine with me, let's do it. He said, you gotta call, you gotta call the, you know, uh, the Mulligan estate and speak with his, with his wife. And, and so I called and um, she said to me, if Billy wants to do it, it's done. And we got the rights like that uh, to do this. Uh, let's, let's see, this is um, Billy and Jerry live at the Guild. What a great cover, huh? Um, and uh, it was just a fantastic process because Billy flew back after we selected all the tracks from the four days and he sat in the studio with us for three days and helped us mix it and stuff. And it was, it was as much about mixing as it was about the, the stories that went with every note. It was really quite fascinating. Let's just hear a little taste, Lenny, please. swing on that for about 10 minutes up in that groove. It's really fantastic. It was such an honor to be part of that. Um, I've got one more that I want to talk about here, um, and that's the great Herbie Mann. Uh, Carrie alluded to the fact that after Herbie passed, um, uh, we have much of his archive there with photos and recordings and just really some music, some, some really fun stuff. These are photos that from uh, 35 millimeter slides that we digitize. In fact, some are in Carrie's book. If you haven't seen Carrie's book on Herbie, it's really a fantastic book. He really did an amazing job delving into the many facets and many kind of faces of Herbie Mann. He was not only one of the great flautists of the world, world but also one of the great human beings and did so much other stuff. Uh, this is uh, when he was in the army from 50 something, right, Carrie? From 51. And then this shot in Brazil I love, which is early 60s? 62. 62. That's um, uh, Joe Beam sitting at the piano and Baden Powell uh, sitting on top of the piano playing guitar. It's really a stunning photo. Um, and Herbie was one of those guys that I'd call Uncle Herbie and I'd say, hey man, you, so what are you doing in April? You want to you come and do something? So he was like Stanley and like Ray and like Billy Taylor and, and like many others that we create these programs around them with whatever they wanted to do musically. And one of the things that we did um, with, that's Phil Woods, the great saxophonist. Um, I put together an anniversary concert, and I think it was our 15th anniversary, and I said, um, hey man, Phil hasn't been here in a while, you wanna do something with Phil? And Herbie on the phone told me this story, he said, Phil, oh shit, I played with Phil in Brooklyn. We played for pasta. True story, right? And so they had played together at these jam sessions, you know, when they were literally kids in Brooklyn um, for food. And they really hadn't worked together since then. So we came and we did the concert, and it was a love fest. Uh, it was a love fest, literally. And a couple months later, I was talking to Herbie about something else. He said, you know, man, we should, we should make a record out of that stuff with Phil. So we actually got everybody back together and uh, we recorded uh, this recording called Beyond Brooklyn, uh, oddly enough, right? And uh, we put all the music together. It was a really stunning, very powerful process. It was the last recording that Herbie ever did. He was pretty sick at the time when we did many of the, of the tracks, but he played his you know what off because he was Herbie Mann and that's what he did. And uh, let's hear just a little, little taste of this, please.
for indulging me. I had to hear Uncle Herbie's full solo there. It, uh, it was an honor. To, I, I only played live with him a handful of times and, of course, played on the record with him. And uh, it, it really is one of those really special, consummate musicians that was always about making music and figured out mm -hmm. how, to, how to make music at whatever he was playing. He played all kinds of gurus from all over the world. It was a big thrill. I want to leave you with one, one last thought here. Um, and, and that is, you know, when I started the Guild program, and actually as a kid, I didn't really understand the importance of legacy and the importance of archiving and the importance of capturing and the importance of preserving and the importance of all that stuff when it comes to this music, whatever kind of music it is that, that, you, that you love. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really get it because um, I just didn't know. My work at the Smithsonian as a Goldman Sachs fellow six, seven years ago really taught me a lot about the importance of that. I started to really get into it in the last four or five years. I've really become kind of like, we need to do this. I'm one of you guys now, man. We need to do this, right? And the importance of it. And it, it really kind of hit me really hard in a positive way about, I think it was two years ago, um, we learned, and I kind of knew, but I didn't know, but I didn't know, and I didn't know it was one of those, right? That in April, late April of 2000, um, Tito Puente, of course, played the concert hall. Um, and he'd been there, I don't know, four or five times before that. Again, he was, he was a great, great friend of the facility. And we stood in our green room, and I said, now, Mr. Puente, it's so great to have you back. How are you doing there? He said, oh, Marty, man, you know, they tell me I should uh, slow it down. I should slow down. And uh, he said, but I told them I only slow down in the next to life. Yeah, true story. So he played. Um, that's a shot from there. And then he left us and he went to Puerto Rico. Um, I don't know if it was for a concert. We can't kind of determine that. So you guys can maybe dig and find that. But we know he went down to Puerto Rico and that's where he had the heart attack. And he made it back to New York. They got him back to New York, but he died in early June. Uh, so this was the last concert that he did in the United States. And that's one of the last photos of him ever playing live. And I didn't really, it didn't really get me, hit me uh, until a couple of years ago when I was talking to one of his family members and we were talking about the timeline and all this and how great it was and then it kind of was like, well, wait a minute, that's the last concert he ever did in the United States and that's one of the last photos. And it really just kind of exclamation point on what amazing work you guys do in uh, you know, preserving this music and this art, all kinds of different musics and making sure that future generations um, have access to this wonderful stuff. So thank you all for being here. Enjoy Pittsburgh. If you're ever in town again, come see a concert. You can go to mcgjazz.org and see what we're doing. And thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to be here. Thanks very much.